What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of the Fundamental Health Podcast. This is a fun one, and this is a really big week for us at Heart and Soil. We have whole package coming out, which is something that I have been excited about for many months, really, since we started Heart and Soil. This is our testicle containing supplement. And I am proud to say this is the desiccated organ supplement with the most amount of testicle on the market. So now with extra testicle whole package. If you guys don't know what we do at Hardened Soil, we make desiccated organs, which are freeze dried from grass fed, grass finished cattle raised in New Zealand. We're working on a US based supply chain. And we all believe deeply in the importance of regenerative agriculture, ecosystem space management of land, and the incredibly unique value of organs in the human diet of eating nose to tail. And testicles have been eaten by males for millions of years. And these are a pretty treasured organ. So check out whole package coming this week at Heart and Soil. You can go to heartandsoil.co to sign up to be notified. It'll probably be out a day or two after this podcast. And we have all kinds of other amazing stuff there as well. I wanted to read you guys a pretty cool review we got on histamine and immune this week. This is from Erin V. She said, I started taking this during the winter months when allergens are not high and for a different purpose. That time, my health practitioners and I thought that histamine sensitivity and high histamine foods were causing gut issues. Well, as it turns out, histamine in foods is not the culprit, so I decided to stop taking the supplement in the height of allergy season. To my surprise, within days, I was experiencing allergy symptoms, sniffles, pressure, scratchy throat, headache. So I purchased more of the supplement to do an experiment within days of taking it again, no allergy symptoms at all. It really works. This is about histamine and immune. So if you guys are having allergy symptoms, check out histamine and immune. If you're a dude or a woman and you're interested in male optimization, uh, libido optimization, hormonal optimization, and a desiccated organ supplement that can eat testicle, get on the list for a whole package. It is coming this week. Uh, and I am so proud of what we're doing at Hard and Soil. Lots of exciting things in the pipeline. This is how we help all of you reclaim your birthright to radical health. My guest on this week's podcast is Daniel Vitalis. As you'll hear, Daniel has been all over the place, had an amazingly interesting life. He was a vegan for a while. I remember when I was a vegan, I was reading his stuff many, many years ago. He had health issues that caused him to change away from his vegan diet. And now he is essentially one of a small group of people who are modern day hunter gatherers. He gets the majority of his protein from things that he hunts and fishes in Northern Maine. We talk about that. We talk about his health journey. We talk about his perspectives on all sorts of cool things. And we talk about eating insects. I definitely think that animal meat and organs are a better source of nutrition for humans than insects. Um, but it's quite interesting that he's been eating cicadas and it was kind of fun to talk to him about that. So Daniel's a really cool guy with some interesting perspectives. And I think you guys will enjoy this podcast about his vegan journey and what he's doing now as a quote, modern day hunter gatherer. So if you enjoy this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple podcasts or wherever you listen, but especially Apple podcasts. This is how we help spread the message to people who may benefit from what we are doing in this animal-based movement. Just as Daniel discovered, animal-based foods are really the center of human diets and plants are mildly to moderately toxic for humans. And if we're not very careful with them or we make them the majority of our diet, we're really doing our own physiology and biochemistry a great disservice. So um, if you appreciate this way of eating, leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for that. As a thank you to those of you who do leave a review, I'm giving away a signed copy of my book every month to one person who leaves a review on Apple Podcast. Thanks again, guys. All right, guys, on to the podcast. Stay radical as always. All right, Daniel, what's up, man? Thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm so happy to be here, man. Really looking forward to this. It's great to have you. And I'm, I think we're going to weave all sorts of conversations in and out of this one about your history as a vegan and what you're doing now, currently as a hunter-gatherer, a modern-day hunter-gatherer in, in the, uh, the wilderness of Maine or the semi-wilderness of Maine as we were working with internet connections. So we'll see how this goes. But I thought, let's start the conversation with Tell me the story of the Brood X cicadas, my man, because I saw on your social media that you ate these. And uh, I'll just say that when I was a kid growing up in Virginia, this must have been two iterations ago. So 34 years ago, 
Um, wow. When I was a kid in Virginia, we had these brood X cicadas and they were freaking everywhere. And we would dare people, we would give them like $5 which was a large amount of money at the time to eat a cicada at lunch. And I don't think anybody actually did it, but apparently <laughs> you collected and ate some of these cicadas. So tell me about the Brood X cicadas, man. Yeah, well, they're fascinating. The idea that you're eating a 17 year old insect. I mean, they've been not like dormant or insisted or in an egg or something. They've been uh, in their larval stage alive, moving around underground for 17 years. This is amazing to me. Cause if you think about, as a deer hunter, if you got like an old buck, he might be seven. You get an old turkey, you know, he might be three. A 17 year old insect kind of blows my mind. Um, I've always found entomophagy really interesting. That's the eating of insects, you know? So there's this, it's transcultural. It takes place around the world. It looks like we're heading towards that in some fashion, you know, in our modern civilization, if things truck along, you know, consistently for much longer, that's kind of where a lot of us are heading, you know, as a protein source. It's never really skeeved me out the way it does other people. A little, but not too much. So I like eating dragonflies. I like grasshoppers. I like crickets. You know, I like June bugs. So when I heard the cicada hatch was happening, man, I was so excited. I'm actually going to go back down to Kentucky um, in a few days uh, to make a show about it. So I'm, I'm pretty hot on this idea. They tasted, you know, I cooked them. So I want to be clear about that. I'm not eating them raw. Like that does kind of gross me out a little bit but cooked, they're crispy. Their wings have the most del like delightful texture of um, almost like if you got one of those fried nori sheets, like very thin and delicate. They're, they taste like peanut. Um, they're delicious. So anyway, and there are billions of them and billions of them. Now that's only going to last a couple of weeks, but you know, I have nerded out. Let me give you an example. Here is my broods of the U.S. map <laughs> laminated my periodic cicada book and best of all my periodic cicada t-shirt i am uh, I'm, I'm deep in the game uh so anyway you know what tends to happen for me when i learn about a new wild food is i'll start to really focus in on it i'll look for um you know monographs on the topic and just learn what i can about it and uh, i was there it was happening so uh yeah we gathered them up so what did you do did you you just you gather them up you collect them they're pretty easy to collect and then you just bake them do you put anything on them yeah. So, so what I did is I, I put them in a jar and put them in the freezer and that kind of puts them into a torpor, right? So they really slow down or stop moving altogether. So about an hour in the freezer, then I washed and dried them. Uh, and then I tossed them in a bit of oil, added chorizo spices to them and salt, laid them out on the baking sheet, put them in the oven at 375 for less than 10 minutes until they're real crispy. People worry with insects naturally that biting into it's going to be like a juicy inside and wet. <laughs> You know, which they are or not. They're they're like if you've ever had uh, grasshoppers at a Mexican, like a Oaxacan place or something, they're crispy. You know, like almost like a carbohydrate type of treat, but protein. So uh, they digest really easy. You feel great after. It's super light, but all your protein needs get met in this sort of really small quantity of food. I mean, it's amazing. So. You know, for me, there are 15 of these broods. This periodical cicada phenomenon is pretty much local just to the United States, Eastern United States. So I kind of have this like goal to catch all the different hatches around the country because there'll be another one, two of them actually in 2025 of a different, uh, two different broods. Oh my goodness. All right. So I'm sure now all of the audience's interest has peaked. Like, tell us the story. How did you arrive at a place in your life where you're living in an amazing place in Maine, which I want to hear about, where where the internet is dicey, but that means that you're living in a cool place. And I get this like inverse relationship between internet bandwidth and quality of living being here in the wilds of Costa Rica. So how did you end up in this place, man? You're eating cicadas. Like, how did you, where, where, tell me this yeah. journey. All right, well, let me just tell you where it's at now. You know, right now, my name is Daniel Vitalis. I have a, a show on uh, the Outdoor Channel called Wild Fed and a podcast called Wild Fed that's focused on wild foods. I consider myself a modern day hunter gatherer, but I say that with trepidation and full respect for, you know, the true hunter gatherers of the world and the small pockets where they still exist. You know, I don't mean to position myself as one of them. I'm just somebody who does hunt and gather my food. So, or a, or a large degree of it. Um, yeah, this started off for me when I was about 15 years old. I just got fascinated by food and by, in particular, by the question of that I think a lot of us have now, what is the natural food for people? 
You know, I didn't care about what science could come up with for a new diet. I wasn't interested in like what new stuff we could come up with. I was like, what is our type of animal as a, like, as a mammal, what do we, what are we supposed to eat? Cause it seemed like new, no one knew. And I grew up before this renaissance in farm to table food. So it was just all processed food. It's like, what are we supposed to eat? I remember sitting one day outside of a supermarket on the grass, eating a mango and I was looking at that supermarket and it looked to me like it had like a spaceship, you know, that had dropped out from, from orbit and landed there. And it's just like, okay, this can't be where food comes from. Where is food supposed to come from? So I chased that idea and it led me into vegetarianism and veganism because it was the early days of the internet. And I got really drawn into the raw food culture and it made sense to me. You know, I didn't have an anthropology background and no one around me. I didn't grow up around really educated folks. Like there was nobody to say, hey, Daniel, there's a science called anthropology where natural human beings have been looked at and ethnographies exist that you can just read and find out what people eat. I, did, I didn't get exposed to that. I was a teenager. So I sort of tried to reverse engineer it. And it was like, well, we must not have cooked because, you know, we wouldn't have had fire. Like what's, a, what's a us as an animal eat? What I didn't know then that is really an amazing fact is that our species, if we're to trust the archeology, span our species, Homo sapiens and current form Homo sapiens sapien, we never learned fire. We were already using fire when the first human came because fire goes back before us to Homo erectus and maybe further. So fire has been around controlled use of fire longer than we've existed. So we are born with that. It's a external anatomy of ours in a way. That's really strange. So I just thought, oh, we must not have cooked. And while it doesn't make sense to me, I would have been chasing animals with my bare hands. I didn't know that we were born using weapons. You know, our species has used weapons since the first Homo sapien. That's, I just, did, I didn't get it then. So I went on like this for a while that I got into raw veganism and I did it more hardcore and more serious than most people do it. I committed myself to it for a long time. About 10 years of the hardcore raw veganism, but probably about 12, 13 years of vegetarianism. And I came across Weston Price's book. I'm sure you're familiar, The Dentist there. You know, when I started seeing he had traveled the world, I think early 1900s, looking at all these hunter gatherers and then also just people living on traditional agricultural life, you know, in their traditional agricultural lifestyle. And he just sort of showed like, hey, I saw animal food was a, in a very important part. And he showed that without some of those fat soluble vitamins in animal foods, you know, we don't get good dentition. We have problems with our dental arch. And uh, it was like, ding, ding, ding. I, like I got it suddenly. And then I was like, wow, I need to focus on anthropology. And real quick, that led me into, you know, I started eating butter by the pound, you know, for real. After that long, I was eating a pound of this grass-fed butter a day. And then, you know, that led me into, I started eating eggs and then started eating fish and then started eating white meats and then red meats. And then and then that, what's funny about that is then down the road, at that time, I was starting to public speak in the world of raw food veganism, but I was not a raw food vegan anymore. So they would let me on stage at these big conferences and I'd get up there and I'd contradict everybody who'd been speaking and the audience would go crazy for it. And I was in demand in these places, but it was starting to create some you know, cognitive dissonance with the basic business model of places that I was being asked to speak and slowly got kind of edged out of that world, but had started my own, you know, out on my own, which was cool. And um, eventually decided, okay, what's the next step for me? I, you know, I'm doing the farmer's market. I'm going, I'm buying a side of beef or I'm buying bison meat. I'm doing all this, but I'm like, I want to go further to the next level. I had been foraging for a long time and it was really hard to get any calories, any significant amount of calories, you know, it's like, it was fun. I liked eating blueberries and raspberries and strawberries, you know, some wild greens and this kind of thing. But it's like, where's the, the mojo, you know? Uh, and similar to what I said before, I didn't grow up around hunters. So it just did not occur to me like, oh, you need to start hunting. That seemed like this Elmer Fudd world. I didn't associate with health practices. So I started with insects. It's the first thing you know, and then a squirrel and then a turkey. And then, you know, over time I got involved in the world of hunting and that's when it all really came together for me. It was like, oh, I could really quickly get all of my animal protein in my house just by hunting. 
And, uh, and once I got serious about that, it took me one year to get protein self-sufficient. Like by the end of my first year of actually really hunting, we didn't, we haven't bought meat since, you know, unless we're at a restaurant or something, we don't need to, uh, we have a huge variety of incredible meats. And, uh, so I hunt, I gather, you know, plants, mushrooms, all of it, and, uh, try to put it all together into a modern context. I love it. I want to hear more about your current hunting and gathering, but I want to drill down a little bit on the vegan and vegetarian side, because I have my own story with this as well. I was a raw vegan for seven months. I only lasted oh, seven months. Yeah. Okay. Uh, about 13 years ago. And most of my audience will know that during that time I lost 25 pounds of muscle mass and was extremely gaunt and had horrible gas. I've written about it and talked about it at various times, but I'm curious about your experience with vegan and vegetarian diets and what eventually led you to include animal foods in your diet. Yeah. Well, it's uh, funny you say that when I was uh, first starting to experiment with it, I had been, uh, you know, working at a gym as a trainer and, you know, into kind of bodybuilding style lifting and was pretty thick uh, and trained with guys who were strong and thick. And, and I started on this diet and every day I'd come into the gym, they'd just be looking at me like, dude, what are you doing? Cause I just started losing weight in my mind, like an anorexic, person, you know, somebody with an eating disorder in my mind, this was a good thing because that world's like a cult. And in it, there's this idea that everything that you're shedding is like toxins. It's one of those things where you'll be like, now it's real obvious to me. It's like, well, define, what do you mean by toxins? Like which toxins? We're, it'd be easy for, especially for millennials and younger to take for granted the access to information that we have right now. You know what I mean? In the way, like, let's say, um, in fighting, for instance, if you remember back in the day, like you could, you could be like, oh, my Kung Fu master is so badass, you know, like, oh, you know, the, my Taekwondo guy is so badass. And it's like, before UFC, everybody could claim whatever they wanted. And then when they all got in the ring together, it didn't take long for like one style to emerge there, but it was like, that's what actually works. Cause all the BS got called out. Right. So I think similarly, you know, now we're, we're in this environment where, if somebody claims something like, oh, that's just the toxins leaving, like it's really easy to be like, what toxins are you talking about? Like, what, how, I had 25 pounds of toxins? What, do you, what does that mean, you know? But back then there was very little information and there, was, there wasn't so much confusion. You know, YouTube hadn't, didn't even exist yet. You know, I, there was no way for me to validate any of this stuff. I just bought into it, to be honest. So I thought losing weight was good. You know, I got pretty skinny. I got down to you know, bare bones. Um, and I lived like that for a long time. Now I, there were some benefits for sure, especially in the beginning, I felt light. I felt amazing. Mostly I felt like I was part of something really special, you know, and what happened was my, my whole ego got woven into this identity. And, you know, now I'm very, um, I'm very skeptical of any isms, anything that ends in ism. I'm like, oh, I don't really, I don't like going down those roads. Cause it's like we get our identity too caught up in something and we'll spend years defending something and not really sometimes open to new ideas. So, you know, but I was young then I bought into it. Um, I had a really good time. I met some zany people. It was quite a ride, you know, and I learned a lot, but I learned a lot of things that weren't true as well. And um, there was really no critical thought. And, you know, over time, I'd say the first half was, was really good. The second half was like fungal infections was, you know, challenges, like always feeling hungry, you know, never feeling satisfied, lots of digestive issues, um, you know, difficult time, like having like regularity and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, eventually I think I was just really, really hungry. Eventually I was just really, really hungry. And, and as you said, and I found this striking because I heard you mention it on another podcast as well. When you started eating butter, you were eating one to two pounds a day. Your body was just so wow. hungry, it sounds like, for these animal fats, yeah. these animal nutrients when you started eating this animal food again. That's crazy, but it's so, yeah. it makes sense. And I wasn't, it wasn't like after I had to go take a nap or I was bogged down. I mean, to me, it's kind of stunning to think about now, but honestly, I was digesting it really well. I ate a lot of fats back then anyway. I lived on a lot of coconut oil and things like that. So my body was pretty, pretty adapted to handling fats. But I mean, I was just blowing through that stuff. And it was the same Then I started drinking cream and milk. And I mean, I could drink a gallon of it a day. And then when I started eating meats, I was eating them raw. 
you know, because I'd been so used to eating raw foods. And, you know, it took me a while to kind of build myself back up. But the weirdest part of that, looking back on it was, it was like, well, what makes me special now? That's been my, I was, that was my special thing, right? I'm the guy who only does the, I'm the guy who defines myself by what I don't do. And that to me is, is a, is a dangerous area to be in. So, you know, today I'm a much more moderate. I think some people would be like, this guy hunts and gathers, meets cicadas. There's nothing moderate about that. But I do feel like I'm a much more moderate person today, you know? Yeah. And I can relate to all of that, having been a vegan and then having transitioned off of veganism and adding meat back to my diet, similarly gaining weight back. But for me, I didn't necessarily fix my autoimmune issues till I did a strict carnivore diet. And so that was the beginning of my journey. And in many ways, carnivory and veganism are similar, though different. And there's a lot of dogmatism in the carnivore community. And in the last year and a half, I've kind of tried to move away from that and think more about, well, what did I learn from eating a carnivore diet? And I learned that some plants really triggered my eczema, plants that many people consider to be healthy. And that I think that that's a valuable lesson for people to understand. Kind of that, I'm curious, like, do you eat any plants now or any derived plant derivative things? And then what plants were the hardest on your body? It's, I'm really curious about that. Yeah. So when, so before I went carnivore three years ago, I was eating like an organic paleo diet. And that means that I ate occasionally ate almonds and I ate other nuts and I would eat some seeds, but not too many things like chia seeds, some. And then I would have salads with like romaine lettuce and radish and sweet potato and things like this, and maybe some olive oil, some avocado. And then I would have grass fed meat and I would eat like, uh, I had a phase that I think actually triggered a pretty big eczema flare for me where I was doing larger doses of mushroom extracts, things like reishi and chaga and lion's mane. And yeah. And so I was in residency, you know, after medical school in Seattle and basically had eczema that went head to toe. And I was like, Oh my goodness, what is going on here? I need to reset my body. So I cut all the plants out and had a period where I became a little bit dogmatic as well, thinking, no, 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 humans don't need any plants. Then as most of my audience will know, after a year and a half, of doing that, I started to get some kind of electrolyte issues and kind of felt cold all the time being in keto because for a year and a half, I ate nothing but meat and fat and organs and salt. And I start, felt kind of cold all the time. I had some palpitations and believe me, it was, I had some cognitive dissonance when I added in carbohydrates back, right? And I started with things like squash, um, which actually ended up triggering my eczema personally. And then I did honey, which didn't bother me at all. And then I went into berries and have kind of gone for the last year and a half with the only plant foods in my diet being things like fruit. And we can talk about why, you know, I, I do that, but I eat, I eat a moderate amount of fruit, especially being in Costa Rica from like a latitude perspective. It kind of makes sense to me to eat fruit, especially if it's growing outside my window, I can basically walk outside, pull a banana off a tree and eat it. So yeah. So fruit has been a positive addition to my diet as has honey. And so when you were telling the story of going to these vegan conferences and getting up and counteracting everything, it made me think about like, I still get invitations to like keto conferences. And I think, do you know what I talk about these days? Like I can't, I, I think it'd be amazing. I love the people in the keto space and I like that we're all thinking about things. But if I were to get up at a keto conference, I would say, hey, I think you guys are hurting yourself with the ketogenic diet long-term. And I imagine that's a little bit of what you were saying at these vegan conferences too. That's it. You know, I, I look at it now, I sort of see like the all animal diet on one end of the spectrum and all plant diet on the other end of the spectrum. But when I look at the anthropology, I'm like, okay, people hunt and gather. And what they hunt and gather is based a lot of, is based almost entirely on where they are. And, and in particular, like latitude, because you get down toward the equator, there's just so much more plant food. And you get up toward the Arctic and there's just so much more animal food dominant in the diet, right? And so I, you know, I think we don't really, we're in the, our infancy in understanding nutrigenomics and to what degree our genome, you know, interacting with how much that matters. I, I try to leave room for both of those extremes to have therapeutic value, but I always joke about like, well, I'm going to launch the, I'm going to launch the omnivore diet, <laughs> you know, it's like it's this radical like, thing. It's crazy. It's called the omnivore diet, you know, hunting and gathering. Um, I, I often reference this, um, You've probably seen it, a report. I think it was the Hadza uh, survey that was done with them, you know, hunter-gatherers in Africa, um, asking men and women separately 
to list their rank their five favorite foods from a list. Have you seen that one? I'm very all, familiar with that one. Both are honey, right? That's number one. And then men, number two, meat. Women, number two, berries. And I find that to be largely true. Like, um, you know, obviously people are, there's tremendous variance, but then you got these bell curves, you know? And I watch my wife around, you know, strawberries, raspberries, you know, like how she's lit up by them and then how I respond to meat. But then it makes so much sense in this historical context, you know? And then it's interesting because then I think it goes baobab for both parties was number three. And then number four, men go berries, women go meat. I think that's how that one went. And then they put tubers like a least favorite, right? Subsistence stuff that they have to eat to get the calories in times of hardship. But uh, I think something you said um, before we started recording just about, you know, hunter gatherers, the quest for meat. I was watching a video the other day uh, of a guy, sort of an adventurer, a YouTube channel where he was asking some folks in Tanzania, hunter gatherers, what's the meaning of life? And the guy's like, oh, meat. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like what's most important in life? He's like, yeah, getting meat. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I really think um, that's, that's the critical piece. We live at, at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So many things are taken care of. It's really easy to get off in these kind of crazy ideas where, oh, you don't need this, you don't need that. We're losing context of what it's like in nature. So whenever somebody talks to me about veganism now, I got like 40 ways to refute it with so much personal experience. But one fun way is like, hey, go watch that show alone. And, or go on that show and try to do it as a vegan. You know, like go out there because somebody who goes into the wild for food, there's a lot of plant food out there, but not the kind you'd need to live on. It's not even, I mean, where I live, it's not even possible. I think we should do that, Daniel. I think you and I should organize the, the, the hunting gathering Olympics. And, you know, we can, we can, we can, yeah, we can, we can invite all of the prominent vegans of the world and, yeah. and, and, and you and I will come up and we'll hunt and gather and, and forage and eat some fruit and kill some animals. And, and we'll see which team wins. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure that the vegans will be puking their brains out in a moment. Change of teams first, you know, because, you know, the, it's really funny. You, if you take somebody and you put them outside, it's like, are you not going to kill mosquitoes? Yeah. Really? You know, really, honestly. And then the other thing I like to play with is like, okay, so if you are willing to kill mosquitoes, is it because they're lower on the artificial hierarchy of life forms you've created? Because most of the time, people who are into those kind of ethical eating programs are also people who are like down with the hierarchies, down with the patriarchy and all those kind of things where it's like, okay, well, you sounds like you're organizing animals on a hierarchy. Is it it's okay to kill mosquitoes, but it's not okay to kill a chicken? Like, is, are, is a life equal? Or do you think that some lives are worth more than other lives? Then we get into some slippery territory. The whole thing just comes unglued. And when you spend time outside, it's pretty obvious. I think that that's the key. And I've tweeted about that in the past, which is ironic that I'm tweeting about this concept. But, <laughs> you know, this like, I just think most people who advocate for plant based and vegan diets have never spent any significant amount of time in the wilderness. And they've never actually had to hunt, obviously not, or gather their own food. And they would quickly realize like, oh, wow, this is a, this is a complete uh, construct that is made up by humans and fails in evolutionary, anthropological, historical, and actual biological terms. So yeah, it's, it's crazy to think about. And I think it hurts a lot of people, which is why I do what I do. So if, if you guys are listening to this and you wanna hear an interview, so I did an interview with Elise Parker and Tim Sheaf many years ago, two years ago on my podcast, you guys can Google, you guys can look for that one. Both Elise and Tim were also four to five year vegans. It's interesting to hear your story, Daniel, because it sounds like for many people, the time horizon at which the nutritional deficiencies set in profoundly is three to five years. Uh, and that's what happened to both Elise and Tim. And you guys can listen to their stories on the podcast if you wanna hear um, what happened to them. And then I'll also add that if you wanna hear my experiences with the Hadza guys, if you're listening, I did two podcasts with Anthony Gustin talking about my experiences with the Hadza because I don't know if you know this, Daniel, I actually went to live with the Hadza for two weeks in February of 2021. So I got to spend time with these people. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I hunted with them in at Lake Yasi. And yeah, it was we asked them the same questions that you know you were you were asking. It was like, what is the most, what is the best day of your life? And they say the day that we hunt and kill the biggest animal. 
And, and that study you mentioned with the, the preferences of men and women is so interesting because when you ask them in person, when we asked them, they said meat, number one, and honey, number two. Um, and then they oh, actually, just... yeah. And then they actually said corn porridge was number three because they've been given ugali by the missionaries. Yeah. So it's, right. it's really kind of a sad thing. But if you look at them, the, the women clearly like meat as well. They just don't get enough of it because there are these, yeah. there are these uh, segregated sexes at the fires. And when the men, the men kill the animals, the women, I've never seen a woman hunt an animal. And when they bring it back to camp, the men eat the animal and then they give a smaller amount to the women. It's kind of interesting. You know, I think can a lot of people- that a little bit? There's a few, there's several like things in there. I want to just pick apart if we can, because one, I guess one, just if you can kind of give me a quick explanation on this one. Um, and people in the carnivore world, is that also, is ketogenic diets and the carnivore diet deeply intertwined or is honey considered an animal food? <laughs> Believe me, there was a, there was a lot of controversy in the very small community of carnivore that I tried to stay out of when I suggested that, that humans could eat honey and that it could be a beneficial food for humans and talked about my experiences and showed some studies because I would say that within the carnivore community, there is a lot of focus on ketogenic diets and low carb. And there's a lot of fear around sugar and specifically the fructose molecule, which I've tried very hard to, uh, to allay in, in, in the audience. But, and I think most people realize it. And, and I hear from people more and more that when they add fruit or add honey back to their diet, the majority of them feel so much better and they're very thankful. But it, is, it parallels in many ways what we see with veganism. Um, and that, that's a quite an interesting phenomenon. I think people want to belong to a tribe. And yeah. I love yeah. that you said that it, as vegan, I think veganism is so, so popular and it continues to be popular because it gives people an identity. Like I am an empathic, kind human. Well, yeah. okay. So here's I'm a question for you. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, do you believe that you can be an empathic, kind human as a hunter? Um, and, and why is there so much confusion about this? Especially given that... Um, it's not like vegans have a monopoly on compassion. And given that compassion is a very rudimentary human emotion and that we've existed for like 300,000 years in our current form. And for almost all of that, we hunted. Obviously there was compassionate hunters. Like it's amazing how, but the problem is we're like dogs. We're like domesticated humans. And so in that domesticated and artificial world, we come up with all these ideas that fall apart really quickly if you pull the walls down, but inside those walls, you know, it's the same with academics, right? And you just sort of see like they come up with all these ideas working inside the colleges, but they never really like go out into the real world. So they don't see that their ideas break down. And then you, when you watch policy start to emerge from those kind of thinkers, and it's like, oh man, I wish you'd go out into the real world before you'd start creating policies, that'd be good. Um, but also that part about, um, men having control over meat is that's a fascinating part of anthropology that unfortunately i don't think enough people want to look at it and how it's influenced how history is rolled out because it's really the the amount of ethnography showing that women have traditionally often even traded their bodies for meat um i'm not putting a judgment on that i'm just saying historically that's something that happened sex for meat was part of the you know, that was part of human history for a very long time. Um, women though, however, I will say um, from the hunting perspective, and there's been some articles showing in some cultures, obviously there's been women hunters, but uh, women often do collection. And so earlier you were asking me about cicadas. You know, that's like, what is that? Is that hunting? It's like, mm, it's not hunting. And I, I sometimes call it like micro game hunting. <laughs> you know, cause you got like big game, small game. I'm like, okay, micro, what, what is picking up clams? right? Or, or crabs or insects. Like, what is that? Well, anthropologists call it collecting. And women would do a lot of that kind of work. You know, and men, I found from what I've read in hunter-gatherer hunter literature, now I've never gone to, to spend time with uh, any hunter-gatherer groups like you just described in any significant way. You know, been to the Amazon a little, but um, the men can often be pretty lazy because they have this one task that's so difficult and dangerous they get injured, they die, they get severe wounds that become infections, you know, they lose an eye, all those kind of things happen on these hunts. Some, you know, they can be dangerous. So the men can become lazy. And one of the things I've read about too a lot is like women using sex to coax men to go hunting. 
it's like, okay, guys, it's been three days. We're getting hungry. Like you need to get out there, you know? So there's this, all this really interesting stuff that is historical that comes from this push and pull from this division of labor that's really pretty unique to our species. I, I, you know, again, without any judgments on it one way or the other, it just is what it is. I just find it all fascinating and a really interesting glimpse into where we come from. Yeah. And I think I loved what you said early in the podcast that if you didn't know about anthropology, at first, vegan arguments sound good until you start to think about them. And then when you really yeah. realize where humans have come from and the nutrients that shaped us and all of the evidence for animal consumption making us human, it's like, oh, this makes absolutely no sense. This is so silly. And yet, because, and this is my greatest consternation, I think, today, and, and hopefully we'll find some way to change it with some actual real studies, because of something called observational epidemiology, right? Because of the way we do science, because of the way we do medical studies, there persists this completely disconnected notion that for some reason, plant-based diets are healthier for humans because of what's healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. And, and there's always these, these observational epidemiology studies that come out that say, oh, people that eat a vegetarian diet uh, you know, that's associated, keyword associated with longer life. Well, when you do the actual, you know, subgroup analyses and you compare it to omnivores who also eat a, or who also, who eat meat, but also have a healthy habits like exercise or sunlight or, you know, good community, they live the same amount of time as vegetarians. And it makes this argument that it's not the food, right? At least it's not the, it's not the absence of meat that makes people live long. It's these other behaviors. And so this is, it's just, it's this, it's this unfounded, really ridiculous idea that refuses to die and that causes people like you and me and Elise and Tim to suffer, you know, unnecessarily. So it's just, it's a crazy, it's a it's silly thing. And totally too. Whenever you see those news stories of, so, you know, so-and-so is 114 years old and she's always like, I smoke three cigarettes a day. I eat a chocolate bar, dark chocolate every day. I have one beer. It's like, what? Like that, you know what I mean? They're, they're never, I, I have rarely find that the people who are the longest lived, at least at an anecdotal level, are people who are even trying to do healthy. I mean, trying to do healthy is a pretty American thing anyway, right? It's like a weird American phenomenon, like where we have tried to build health through this like Lego piece approach of stacking all of these different practices. It's a pretty uniquely American phenomenon. My wife is from Montreal. And so being you know part of French culture her whole life, they have this very mo like moderate approach. And living with her, I've realized what an extremist I am. Because my way will be like binge on something, then don't touch it for three months. Then binge on it, don't touch it for three months. Like that, you know, I'm like, I have this kind of like extremist attitude where she'll be like, dude, that's crazy. A little bit every day and don't overdo it. And I'm like, that works pretty good too, you know? I mean, I'm just thinking human beings are, have always been obsessed with food because the acquisition of it's been really, really important to us. And we're still obsessed with it in an environment where we just, I think the reality is we just have too much of every kind of food, but we get confused about a lot of different things. Like one of the interesting ones, I, you may have heard me talk about this idea of processed food. I find this fascinating because when you hunt and gather, the biggest bottleneck in the modern world is processing that food. And so, you know, you bring me a deer, dude, I got to do some processing. I got to gut that deer. I got to skin that deer. I got to break it down into primals. Then I got to get the meat off the bone. I got to get it packaged. It's like a lot of work to turn that into the next 20 meals or 30, 50 meals, whatever it's going to be. Um, when I bring plants home, it's a lot of work. Like if you gave me a, you know, a bag of black walnuts, you know, it's like, okay, I got to dry them. I got to break off those husks. I got to crack those shells. I got to pick that meat. There was a moment in history where suddenly machines and labor allowed people to get their food pre-processed because everybody used to have to process their food. So now we have this thing like processed foods bad. And what we mean is industrial food is bad, but we say processed foods bad, which is not true. It's like, it's processing to take an, a banana out of its peel. That's processing, you know? That work we've, that's actually the bulk of human work through time. It's the origins of, no doubt it's the origins of music, you know? 25 people sitting around banging on mortars and pestles and tapping on things to break them and a rhythm breaks out. And over time, people start to develop these rhythmic sounds as they process food. That's like the beginning of storytelling. It's the beginning of human culture. 
just people sitting around processing food. So there was this moment where we got like liberated from having to do that, which I think is one of the great dangers because now a person eats asparagus and doesn't know what an asparagus plant looks like. People eat a cod, they never seen a codfish. You know what I mean? Like we, we don't even know what the, the organism is. And for me, when it comes to plants, animals, mushrooms, algae, I, I like to just step back and be like, every single one of those is a living creature. We have grouped them as animalia and plantae and fungi and algae. You know, we have these kingdoms that we, you know, I don't want to say they're arbitrary, but we've kind of made up all these categories. But if we step back and we go, they're all life forms. One of the main things that gets me hunting and gathering as someone with a business who's been successful, I can go buy food. I don't have to do all this. I do it because I want to know the creatures that I eat whatever kingdom they come from, I want to be more than know them. I want to be in relationship with the things that I eat. And if you take the processing out of that and the acquisition out of that, and you just have the eating part, you don't know. It's like no relationship. Uh, that part's weird to me. So weirder to me than the fact that people eat industrial food. I think it's far stranger that I at least can understand there's ease and, you know, comfort or whatever. What I don't understand is eating living things your whole life and not knowing what any of them look like in their natural environment. I've heard you say this, and I heard you say that we eat species we have never met. And I thought that was such a, an insightful comment. Like, and what is implicit and what comes out of that statement is that when we meet the species that we eat, it changes the way that we consume them, doesn't it? I mean, isn't, is that your experience with what you're doing? Yeah. And, and there's a couple layers to that. Cause there's maybe I go, um, haddock fishing and I see haddock, I was haddock fishing this week. So I'm thinking of them. Um, you know, I see all these haddock, but then I eat those haddock and that's different than I go to an aquarium and I see a haddock and then I go buy, buy haddock at the store. Those are two different things, both good, but they're different. Like one is, okay, now I know what the organism is but I don't know what this one I'm eating, where it came from, what its story is or any of that. This is a very new phenomenon. When in history have people not had personal, you know, aside from, you know, I, I, aristocracy or royalty in the past, who else would just not have any connection to the foods they're eating? People were so much closer. You know, I'm talking from 150 years ago, back 300,000 years or more, we have known our food. So this stuff is all really weird where it just shows up and you don't know who picked it. You don't know where it came from. You don't know the organism. You don't know the country of origin, any of it. It's like, wow, that's really weird. So I really like sitting down to a meal and the skull of the animals there. I like that. You know, it's like, you know, I've eaten all those bears back behind me. It's like those skulls are bears that I've sat down to eat. And when I'm eating them, there they are. You know what I'm saying? Like that level of depth and relationship to me is like the difference between, it's like my intimate relationship with my wife. When I make love with my wife, man, it's our souls are making love too, not just our bodies versus like some, maybe a casual encounter through a glory hole, right? It's like totally anonymous. You know what I'm saying? It's like that level of like, wow, we are like, we don't even know who's on the other side. So I like to eat animals that, that I've met. So all of these, I was gonna ask you about these skulls behind you. These are all bear skulls because some of them look different than others. Uh, there's, a couple, there's a couple randoms, like a couple of porcupines and a raccoon back there, but all those ones in the middle are, those are all small bears. I got some, I got some significantly bigger ones in the, in the other room, but, and I don't know if you can see that alligator right there behind me, but uh, I'll pull him up. Oh, that was an old man I ate. Wow. So tell me, all right, tell me the story of this alligator. Where did you hunt and eat this alligator? And when was this? Down in uh, South Carolina. One of the, so, you know, here's, and, and this ties into some, I think, a uh, valuable piece for anybody who's listening to this being like, man, I kind of like to at least, you know, I'm hardly saying like, hey, everybody needs to go hunt and gather. I understand how extreme and radical and, I mean, not in a historical context, it's not, but in a modern context that that's not for everybody. But let's say somebody's listening and like, hey, I'd like to at least try that. Um, I didn't grow up hunting. So I don't, I don't come to the table. I started in my late 30s. I didn't come to the table with all kinds of experience and knowledge. Like if you grew up 
you know, what we like, we'll call around here, like redneck. And you just grow up knowing where catfish are and how to get at them. You know what deer are and where they bed and where they winter. You just come with all that ecological knowledge. You know, it's pretty sad that we'll make fun of people who have that level of ecological knowledge because they don't have the, uh, they don't know about all the humanities, right? They, don't, they didn't read Shakespeare. So we make fun of them, but they actually know about the planet they live on. That's like, we got our priorities wrong. You know, that's for sure. We want to have integrated ecological knowledge. So I didn't grow up with that. So when I started hunting, I was like, well, what else can I do besides just the traditional hunts that require that I know a lot about these things? And one of the things that I've gotten involved in is nuisance tag hunting, where, you know, this alligator is an example, but just to kind of give you another, uh, there's a farm um, a couple towns away that, you know, they have a problem with deer eating the pumpkins they grow. And so the state issues them a handful of nuisance tags where they can shoot deer to help reduce the amount of deprivation on their, on their squashes. Um, so I go in there and at night I hunt deer. Now this is a lot easier than trying to track down deer in the woods, right? I don't need all that ecological knowledge. And what I end up with are these really great deer, you know, a bunch pumpkin of them. Fed. Pumpkin fed deer, yeah. Um, this alligator lived in a wetland in South Carolina and he, had, he was so big that, um, you know, because that was an area where people recreate, it's like, hey, that, that alligator's big enough to eat a person, right? He was 10 foot, eight inches long, maybe my age, which is kind of crazy to think about. And, uh, you know, he was going to get removed from there. And so I got invited to come down and do that removal and, uh, and butchered him myself and uh, brought him home and fed him to me and my wife and my dog and, uh, you know, and there's his skull, what's left, to, what's left to him. You know, I, there, I keep bringing up the skulls, but it's like, it's so powerful in a culture where we have closed ourselves off from death so much. So the death head to me is so important as a reminder of, hey man, live this life. I, I met a guy the other day, 66 year old Cuban guy. And he's, uh, he's just giving me all these little life lessons, you know? And he says, he says, my number one piece of advice, live till you die. I was like, yeah, dude, simple, but super smart. But if we forget we're going to die because we live in this culture that pretends everything's immortal, that's the weird thing about vegans. They think that animals are just going to go on living forever. It's like, no, they're probably going to be dead by the end of the year. They don't live very long in the wild. It's a hard place. They live a long time in the zoo. They don't live so long in the wild. Um, so, you know, having those death reminders, those skulls remind me like, hey, I got one right in here, man. And it's... Uh, that's all that's going to be left to me and not too long. Right. Really. And, you know, I keep a picture on my desktop of, uh, I got a dental x-ray with picture of my skull. I was like, wow, can I have that picture? Like I look at all these other skulls. I want to remember, you know, what I'm actually, you know, what I am at the, at the root, you know, which is like one of these animals. And, and that's something that people who, who don't butcher animals ever, there's something that you miss out on, which is seeing what you're like on the inside. Uh, it's super humbling. It's really an important and humbling thing. Like even if somebody just like one time you go butcher some chickens with somebody or you butcher a cow with somebody or you go hunting, it does give you that, um, you know, I'm sure you saw that when you were uh, in Africa. It's like just that, like, oh man, it's all like, there's a liver, there's a heart, there's the kidneys. Like that's all what's in me too. Man, we need to remember that right now more than ever. I think that's so important. I, I want to ask you about your tattoos. I don't have any tattoos, but I'm thinking about getting one on my arm and I wanted to say, remember that you will die. You know, yeah. I want to get some sort of death, <laughs> some sort of death reminder yeah. on my arm because it, this, this is something I've thought about a lot. And there's some, I forget what culture it's from, but there's a, a parable or an adage, like a good life is lived by thinking about death three or five times a day. I'm sure someone will know this and correct me, but yeah. I think it's so true. And I love, I, I, I that's one of the things that's been really, meaningful and impactful for me in my own hunting experiences is when I walk up on the deer that I've shot with an arrow or shot with a bullet, it's this immediate reminder, like live your life well, because this animal probably gave itself to you. Um, you at least took its life. And this is part of the cycle of life and death. And, yeah. um, and, and now you're being nourished, but one day you will be food for Ooh. fungi, bacteria, Ooh. worms. That's it. That's yeah. it. And and that animal didn't know that deer you shot woke up that day like every other day. 
like somebody who walks out in front of a bus accidentally. It's like that deer just gets up and it's on a collision course with your bullet or your arrow, but doesn't know. And the bullet is moving through space time. Maybe it's in your pocket, the magazine, your rifle. Eventually it's in the muzzle. It's moving through space time. That deer's moving through space time on a collision course and they interact at one point and you meet and then it's food. And I mean, that is so powerful to me. I think about the, you know, this 30, 40 year alligator living its life, having no idea we're going to meet like that. I mean, that's just, it, it's very humbling to me. And, uh, I agree. I've heard that from many cultures, you know, that idea about remembering your death, you know, I've heard it from in many different ways. And um, we just, we're the opposite in this culture. We have found all these ways to obfuscate that. Yes. I think that we forget, uh, we forget that we're mortal. We forget that life is not infinite and that that affects the way that we behave. I mean, even, you know, when I'm out surfing here in Costa Rica, you think people get in fights over waves and you think, man, remember that you will die. Like you're yeah. in the ocean doing yeah. something that is so much fun and you're arguing with, that's just, that's just an example that's relevant in my world right now. But yeah, I, get no, I get it. I get it's it, dude. Totally I mean, silly. as a deeply flawed human being with like all kinds of problems and baggage and all the stuff I bring to the table, sometimes like I look back on my behavior and it's like, oh man, like why would I ever want to make anybody's day any harder? Like what it takes just to survive, you know what I mean? Why would I ever want to engender conflict or why would I ever want to, you know, and it's funny because I say that, um, but I don't think of hunting as conflict, you know? And I think that's another, there's a couple interesting things with hunting. Um, I've noticed as I talk to people who want to start hunting, but don't have experience, it's like one is the violence of it. And this, the other one is the idea of a weapon. And those two things, lately I've been asking people like, hey, when you, what is a weapon to you? When you hear weapon, like how does it land? And for so many people, it's like this really dark and negative word. And I just, I guess I was like, oh, I've always had such a positive association. To me, weapons are a beautiful human tradition reaching back to not just antiquity, to our origins. And that type of violence, the acquisition of food, it's so fundamental to us. Like, I don't think like, oh, lions, they're so violent or you know, I don't think, oh, cicadas, they're so bad the way they kill trees. You know, I just, I just doesn't, I don't think like that. Like that's how the whole, th every organism living here, those conditions of predation are what it has striven against to make it strong enough to actually live here. I often think like, man, we need a predator. You know, you see these like disclosures from the government, right? And there's all this talk about, what are they saying now, UAPs? And it's like, Man, I, you know, I, I have, I, I, I strongly doubt the, you know, alien takeover or anything like that. But it's always like, man, if something came down here, remember the Predator movie with Schwarzenegger, you know? Yes. That's what I first was like, man, I love that skull collecting that he did. But, but you think about something like that and like how actually might be good for us in a way, right? Because like, it's good for gazelles to be preyed upon by lions. Yeah, I've heard you say that. And I thought it was, I thought it was interesting that, that, that in some ways the gazelle can thank the lion for culling its species and making it a stronger, faster, you know, species. And, and certainly the gazelle that gets eaten by the lion is part of the life death cycle, but that, that overall being a part of that cycle of life and death is, is just a beautiful thing, no matter where you are in that cycle. And I think we've all got predators. We just don't know. Maybe our predators are just different today. I, I think, yeah. I think in some ways, you know, COVID is a predator. Uh, I yeah, yeah, we have microbiological predators that are coming for us, and and we certainly have ideological predators. I believe, you know, in the form of well, vegan, vegetarian diets, or medical untruths, or you know, sure. uh, obfuscated uh, medical research, or ideas like that. And then also, I think that it, I like your word industrialized food. In some way, we could think of industrialized food as a predator. I think of yeah. a lot of um, I don't know what word to use here. A lot of entertainment is almost a predator for humans. Uh, I know you interviewed Michael Easter. I want to get him on my show, the guy that wrote The Comfort Crisis. But I think that uh, I've heard him say, gosh, we, we're afraid of boredom now. And so if we're not yeah. on our phone, then we're yeah. watching Netflix. But um, I think that these devices or the use, not these devices in general, but the way that we've grown accustomed to using them, in some way, that's... that's uh, and it's ultimately like corporate predation, yes. technological. Well, there's a lot of two-legged predators for sure. I sometimes wish we had something that came out of the shadows and scooped us up and ate us. Chupacabra. So, yeah, maybe something bigger even. Because, uh, you know, it's like, it humbles how you move through the environment. I mean, you look at people who go out west to hunt and, you, you know, I'm in the east. 
we have black bears, but black bears mostly run away from us. They, they'll eat you, but it's, you know, they, most of the time they run away from you. But out West where they have grizzly bears, and brown bears, there's a, people approach the landscape differently. And this, this human domination of the landscape comes from the fact that we've pushed all the predators to extinction or into extirpation or into places that we largely don't go. Um, but I wanna say too, it's not just the gazelle does get stronger and faster, but also there's individuals that get removed from the population and that strengthens the genome. And one day, if we make it as a species, we'll look back and be like, oh, this era we might call like the genetic apocalypse. Like not only did we start playing with our DNA and playing with our RNA and playing with synthetic RNA, but we, we didn't ever think about the consequences of, boy, this is delicate territory. I'll just leave it at that. I think we could use something that picked off, you know, those unfit for the environment. But the thing is, is that our built environment, everybody's bit fit for it. Everybody's fit for the, the built environment, but very yeah. few of us are fit anymore for actually Earth's environment. That's why we need so much stuff to go into environments because we're not really fit for it anymore. Yeah, I've, I've heard you say this in the past too. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you've called it like Homo sapiens fragilis. Yeah, domestico fragilis. Yeah, domestic. I proposed the idea that we maybe should be reclassified in our, our modern form you know, those Hadza would be homo sapiens. Right. Because they represent, you know, in this kind of schema that I'm talking about, they represent the wild type. So that's the same as a, a gray wolf is the wild type, but the domestic dog is a wolf, but it's the domestic form. So what are we then? And so I've I've proposed the idea homo sapiens domestic or fragilis because we're fragile and domesticated. And domesticated just means belongs to the house. And I think that's a great example. You know, it's like a little corgi or like a little dachshund. It's like that animal really can't, you can't set it free to go live in the wild. I, I always love teasing the vegans. Like, where are we, what are we gonna do with these cows? Where do you wanna, you wanna keep them in a zoo? Cause I thought you didn't like zoos. You wanna let them all die? I thought that was what you're fighting against. Do you wanna set them free and watch them get picked apart by predators? Like, what do we wanna do with all these cows we have, right? Like yeah. they can't survive on their own really, you know? During some of my previous conversations about COVID, this concept of, and this is an epidemiologic technical term used in, in epidemiology literature with regard to sort of virology and, and the way that viruses move through the species, but the term is dry tinder, uh, looking at any population. <laughs> um, but it's not meant to be pejorative, really. It's just that, uh, it's just that, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, but I swear this is a technical term, but I think it's, it's true that in any, in any population, he's just cracking up, <laughs> in any population that there is dry tinder, there are those individuals who, who are the oldest, who are the most frail and the most likely to get picked off by a predator. And I think that what you're saying has merit. It's certainly probably gonna ruffle some feathers, but that's what we do on this podcast. But I think that like, when you know that if you are the slowest, weakest member of the herd that you are likely to be susceptible to predation, that may just motivate you to not be the slowest, most fragile member of the herd. That may motivate you to not eat industrial food. That may motivate you to, to do more exercise, to get in the sun, to not in eat the donut. Ways, there's perverse incentive to not care for yourself. Yeah. That's the, one of the problems that we're having. So I like how you just framed that because, because that dry tinder is what gets picked off by the lion. And that's why the herd is stronger. But for us, because we've gotten to the top of that food pyramid or however you wanna look at that, that food web, and we kind of dominate it now, there's no controls for that. Now, I wanna be super clear, cause you're right, it will ruffle feathers. I do, I am not talking about eugenics, okay? Right, I want right, to be right. super ultra clear. Like, I don't believe that there should be any kind of like top down management of that, or that's disgusting to me. It's been tried in horrible ways. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what you're talking about the self managed um, health, because I don't want to fall to the back of the pack here. But I would also say, like, show me where it's been helpful to us. No, I'm not saying that to you, but just, you know, rhetorically, how is it helpful to us to not have that? You know, that's a, I think that's a, 
because you look around at the stress that the world is under because of how many people there are. We're just in this weird place. We, we live with so much cognitive dissonance, you know? And, and I think specifically, I'll clarify that in a lot of these studies looking at COVID, these were epidemiologists and population researchers, immunologists, virologists saying, when there is a weak or a, uh, a light, I don't know what word to use here, uh, uh, a less severe flu or viral season one year, then there are more members of the population that are susceptible, that are elderly, that are frail, that are carry over to the next year. And then you can see large, um, large susceptibility to viruses and quote predators when there's more dry tinder. And so that's, that's really the it's context like of the term. Fire, right? Just like forest fire and the buildup. Yes, up exactly. Of- that's the idea that if you don't, if you don't manage the forest by letting fires happen occasionally, there will be dry tinder and you can get a big forest yeah. fire. So there were some well, arguments. Too, I, w- I was talking to a Diné woman recently. She was talking about that her people believe there should be about 10 trees per acre in a managed forest. I mean, that's incredible when you think about an acre, 10 trees. But that's how they managed their, especially their nut crops and such. And they did it with fire. And when you picture humans on the landscape, one of the neat things about us is that we make fires. This is why, this is why the carbon argument gets pretty, it's kind of touchy because that's what we do. We make fires, you know? And if you think about if you and let's say you were 50 people, 30, 50 people hunting and gathering through an environment, think about how much wood you need to burn. It's not like one fire for the whole group. Like you've got a fire in your lodge and so does all the other little clan groups, right? Like everybody's got a fire. So any kind of dead wood is getting picked up and brought back to camp. And again, interestingly, this is one of those jobs that women bore the brunt of through history. You know, it was like firewood gathering. Um, Bringing all that wood back to camp, burning it, breaking down the stuff you can reach. And then when you move on, like one idea we've always talked about hunter gatherers moving around to follow the herd or follow food but some people have presented the idea that well we might have to move because of a lack of fuel and so you come back now that forest is now safe from that forest fire right because we go through that's part of our ecological niche is like we go through and we clear out deadwood you know and that's kind of like a neat thing that humans do but when we leave forests alone we create the conditions for this massive destructive thing. And, and so, yeah, arguably like, like who's at fault for COVID, you know, is it, is it natural? Was it a pangolin? Was it a bat? Is it the Chinese? Is it the virology labs? Did Fauci do it? It's like, well, who's responsible for all these underlying conditions that make people really susceptible to it? You know, that's like an even more important question is like, how do we not fall into those categories? Some people get dealt a really bad hand and some people get a good hand, but play it really bad. And I think that's where we have a lot of control is how you play your hand, you know? Exactly. And that's, I think that's why we both do what we do. Now, we talked a little bit about the hunting. Maybe we'll come back to a couple of stories about, about that. But I want to talk about your, your consumption of plants um, in, in the foraging realm, because we talked about this a little bit before the podcast. Um, and I have, when I was thinking about carnivore or animal-based diets, it, it kind of made sense to me. And I think this is, this is not really debatable at a botanical level, but it's not talked about much. The fact that different parts of plants are different levels of toxicity for humans and different plants are different levels of toxicity for humans and even different fungi are different levels of toxicity for humans. And so I, I, thought, that it, I thought that it would be helpful for people to understand, and this is one of the things I've tried to do in my work, uh, a communication of a plant toxicity spectrum. And the idea that if you're thinking about things from the perspective of a plant, a plant is rooted in the ground and it's making a seed, which is really its reproductive effort. And so it's probably going to put some defense chemicals in the seed, like an egg corn. Maybe you can tell us about like all the things you have to do to eat egg corns, um, right? Like how toxic they are if you don't process them, but also the leaves. And I, I've heard you talk about goitrogens and overconsumption of brassica vegetables. But I think that, um, you know, I'm sure that when you're doing your foraging, you're thinking about this. So in your collection and consumption of plants, how do you think about these plant, do you think about plant toxins? How do you think about plant toxins? And what sort of things are you doing to sort of detoxify these and make these plants edible or usable for you? It's a really good question. And it's a deep question. There's a lot to it. In botany, they often talk about a plant's secondary uh, metabolic compounds, secondary metabolites, 
Those are those toxins that you're talking about. Um, plants create those for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons is to limit herbivory. Now, plants aren't trying to stop herbivory all the time, but they're trying to limit it to a degree. I think of plants, it's interesting how when we think of manufacturing, we talk about a manufacturing plant, like the idea of plants produce things. And I think plants think of themselves this way, metaphorically, like they, they produce surpluses. They want to be used, fruits, for instance, as a seed dispersal system, but they don't want to be destroyed, right? So they, as foragers, one of the things we're always um, looking for is meristematic growth. That's the young shoots. If you think about asparagus, that's the meristematic, the soft, the fibers haven't gotten real stiff yet. And all those secondary metabolites haven't accumulated yet mm. that make the plant bitter and hard to eat. We have a sense of taste for bitter because bitter is how we detect toxicity in foods most of the time. So we're looking for those less bitter young shoots, that quick early growth. That stuff's usually edible, but then as the plant matures, now think about this too, in the springtime, you know, we've just come through our spring foraging season. In the spring, there's no insects out yet. Very little herbivory from insects. So plants focus on rapid explosive growth during the time when those herbivorous insects aren't out. So they don't start to produce all those toxins right away so that they can focus on growing. And then when the insects come out, they start to get real bitter and toxic, right? To reduce the amount of herbivory. So you end up with these specialist insects that can eat and deal with certain things, but we're trying to get that stuff. So the asparagus is the best example. People who eat from the supermarket or the farmer's market will know that plant turns into this hum, you know, five foot tall fern looking kind of plant. Most people wouldn't recognize, but they exactly. know that as asparagus, right? So there's a lot of plants like that, that when they're shoots, will break those off when, you know that thing where you, you do the bend test on asparagus and it snaps and you're like, okay, that's the part you eat and there's the part you discard. That's what we're doing in the wild. We're finding the place where it snaps off. Everything above that is soft enough to be like pleasant food. And usually the bitterness will be really low. Um, as things get more bitter, we end up having to do more processing, things like leaching or removing outer uh, bark or removing, you know, peels and things like that to get rid of some of those toxic parts. But here's um, what I would contend. There's no difference between the word poison and the word medicine, except for dose. So something like if somebody thinks of any kind of pharmaceutical, typically in the right dose, that's poison. And in the small enough dose, it can trigger some kind of therapeutic effect. I'm not a farmy guy. I'm just saying like, they'll have that action, right? It's like, Hey, a couple aspirin might get rid of your headache. Bottle of aspirin might kill you, right? It's all a dose dependent. So all pharmaceuticals, what about 80% of them are derived from plant metabolites. So originally these things are in plants and what we found through herbalism through the course of human history is, Hey, what's the right dose where this thing isn't poison enough, poisonous enough to really harm you but just enough to cause an effect that maybe you want for some kind of allopathic reason, right? So you're trying to create some effect. So what's the right dose um, where this thing causes me to have a bowel movement, but doesn't give me like pathogenic diarrhea, right? So I guess that if that's an example, or maybe somebody's got diarrhea, it's like, what's the right amount of tannins to tighten up the tissues and slow that down without actually being too much of an anti-nutrient. So poison and medicine, it's a very, very fine line. So I think of a lot of these toxins in plants as medicine in the right dose, but some of them I don't want at all. So acorns you brought up, they are so high in tannins, right? That it takes about 10 days of leaching in cold water to wash all that out, to turn that into a food. You know, if acorns could just be eaten off the ground, man, I'll tell you, everybody in the northern latitudes here, or, or I guess temperate zone, we'd, we'd be living on acorns. Imagine, you know, but they're, they're, they're everywhere, but they're not food until I've done this tremendous amount of processing. So that stuff does need to be removed. And then people, again, because they don't process their own food, they've lost this. And because we've been running a genetic modification program on plants for 11, 12,000 years in the form of agriculture and selective breeding. 
So domestication of things, whether it's plants or animals, is also called unnatural selection. That's kind of interesting. Um, and what that means is rather than let the plant or the animal decide who it will breed with, we decide who it will breed with because we want to mix the qualities of those things. So if I take a, if I like this dog because it's fast and this dog is fast and I breed them together, I should get some fast pups. And eventually I could end up with a greyhound, right? That's sort of, that's unnatural selection, humans making those decisions. Through that process, before we had sophisticated genetic modification tools like we have today with CRISPR, or at least those are more sophisticated than the early agriculture was just selective propagation. And we changed plants to remove a lot of those toxins. What we've ended up with is plants that don't have much of those bitter compounds anymore. So that people are like, what are you even talking about plants are toxic? But it's again, it's like, well, come out with me and let's take a walk and just start tasting things. And you'll see, oh, this wall of green out here isn't very edible. I need to know very specifically which parts of the plant at which time of the year. And often some things can just be picked and eaten, but for the most part, I need to know the correct processing methods to render that into food. And you kind of astutely point out here, I mean, you just don't have a, a poisonous look like deer. You just don't run into that kind of, um, that need for that level of sophistication and understanding the processing. And with mushrooms in mycology, it gets even more dicey because it's very easy to kill yourself with, with poisonous mushrooms that you misidentify. And so the, as you move from animals to plants to fungi, you need greater levels of sophistication in navigating the toxic terrain. Um, now, why I bring the thing up about goitrogens often is this, I don't think people realize how few foods are in their produce section. I mean, we're just eating the same stuff in multiple forms. So the easiest way to lay that out would be, um, hey, I could get a, a greyhound and a dachshund and a German shepherd and a Alaskan Malamute, we could go on and on. I could get 50 different dogs here and you could go like, look at this variety. And it's like, no, they're all one species. They're all dogs. So you could eat all of them and you're just eating dog. That's all you're eating. And you go into the supermarket and you're like, oh, kale, collard, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, rapini, all of those are Brassica oleracea. So people bring home seven different ones thinking, oh, I'm going to eat a different vegetable every night. And they don't know they're actually eating one plant. And that plant just, it still has this residual amount of a goitrogenic compound. Now, I'm not, obviously people are doing this all the time and we're not running around with goiters. But what it does is it inhibits the incorporation of iodine into the thyroid. So, you know, that's a, that's a big deal. We want to make sure we're cooking those, removing that stuff or denaturing it and mostly we want variety so that we're not getting too much of that. So if you didn't know that, you could think you're eating different stuff every day and it's like, hey, you're eating the same plant over and over and over again. Some of the toxins in plants, I would say like, for instance, some of the sulfuric compounds in garlic, let's say. If I gave you enough of that, it'd burn a hole in your mouth. I mean, bite into a raw garlic clove, it hurts. Swallow one, chew it up and swallow it. You'll puke within 30 seconds, you'll puke. The most mucilaginous vomit because your body has to actually coat that in slime just to keep it from burning you, right? So in a small amount, that's an antifungal, that's an antimicrobial. It can be used therapeutically in the wrong dose or in the wrong way. It's, it's quite toxic to you. So I think it's all about people have learned over time. If you go to any hunter-gatherer culture, they have very sophisticated ecological knowledge of place so that they know how to use the plants in their environment, when to use them, and for what. Um, but we're living in this weird remove, like divorced from nature environment. We just go to the supermarket. We have no idea what these plants are. And we've never met them and we have no idea how to interact with them. Yeah. So I completely agree with you. And one of the points that I make in my book is that there's a difference between using plants as medicine and using plants as food. Um, if you're using as something as medicine, you're using it, like you said, as an antifungal or an antiparasitic or an anti diarrheal. When I was in Africa with my buddy, Anthony Gustin, and again, we did two podcasts, guys, if you want to hear about those experiences, we, uh, we both, but he first got a GI thing. So he was like, oh, I don't feel good. And immediately the Hadza guys are like, oh, come with us. And they dig up this bitter root of this bush 
and, and they give it to him to eat. And, and I tried some too. It tasted like absolute crap. It, it tasted horrible. It was completely bitter. It was nothing that they would ever use as food, but they used that root of the plant as a medicine in that moment. Now, I think that usually, or perhaps often when people have those symptoms in Tanzania, it could be a parasite or something in the gut. And perhaps there's a bioactive compound in this root that acts as an antiparasitic or an anti-helminthic. In this case, if you guys listen to the podcast we did, we think it was too many of the berries. Uh, they, they had these like really mucilaginous berries and we went ham on these berries. And then we both were like messed up for days and days and days. They love these berries, by the way. But I think that's a good use of plants as medicine versus food. And so the way that I've always thought about this is, okay, like I, I want people to understand that plants do make these defense chemicals. Eggcorns are a great example the whole brassica species is a great example. And if you look at herbivorous animals, and we are not herbivores, we are, I believe, animal specialized omnivores, and I'll clarify that in a moment. Um, they, they don't eat a lot of one plant. They're eating lots of different species and moving between plants, so they don't over accumulate alkaloids or other defense chemicals. But with our, quote, domesticated, you know, selection of plants in the grocery store, I think for a lot of us, we are overeating many of these plants and perhaps getting levels of these toxins that are harming us, which has been kind of the focus of my work, saying, well, think about plants in a toxicity spectrum. And the corollary idea there is, if you can, because many of us can go to the grocery store and buy meat or buy organs or get desiccated organs like we make at hardened soil, if you can get these like higher foods, these higher priority foods for hunter-gatherers, and you can get these less toxic foods like fruit or honey, why not eat those rather than the more toxic plant foods that you're probably over accumulating all of these toxins in your body in the first place. And so I've sort of been, uh, I've joked that I'm like an anti-broccoli crusader. I'm just like, you don't need broccoli ever. <laughs> and please don't ever eat spinach because you don't need to. Certainly uh, the Hadza do eat pumpkin leaves occasionally. Counter-gatherers do eat these plant leaves occasionally from what I've seen or read. But my suspicion is that it's, it's, it's way down on the food pyramid. I mean, pumpkin leaves weren't even on the first five foods they talked to people about in the Hadza camps about what they like to eat. They're like, it's not even on the list, right? They're like, well, if we don't have anything else to eat, maybe we'll grind up some baobab seeds, you know, and make a flour out of it. They have like different levels of, of, uh, of survival foods versus foods that they prefer is my impression. So that's kind of how I've, uh, how I've made like, this. All right, push against all this. Um, man, I... All right, so I, I'm wondering how you feel about, let's say a, a group like the Anishinaabe who in the Great Lakes region of the US who traditionally, you know, wild rice is like the food for them, mm -hmm. right? Their life is defined around it. And it's a grain, it's a wild grain. You know, I harvest wild rice here and you know, I mean, what an awesome, I, I love to eat it. Uh, I harvest, um, you know, because I don't keep bees, I don't live in a place where wild, you know, honeybees are endemic. I harvest maple syrup from my trees, sucrose, baby, white sugar, you know, it's, that's some sweet right there. So I'm curious about like staple foods like that, that are high calorie, um, because I do see that people do that around the world. So I'm curious about that. And then I'm also curious how you feel about drugs, uh, since we're talking about controversial stuff, because man, um, coca leaf. Wow. I mean, I've chewed some coca leaf in South America or ayahuasca or San Pedro or peyote or cannabis or cacao or coffee. How do you feel about these plants that, um, while I won't try to argue the health benefits of them, definitely add a beautiful dimension to the human experience. So I guess, you know, first about, you know, high calorie density, wild foods, and then, yeah, drugs. Yeah, yeah, so the, I don't know much about this Great Lakes culture. I'd have to look into it. My curiosity is, how long have they been doing this? Because um, is, is their move, do we know, right? This may be a hard thing to reconstruct, but how long have they been eating white rice? Because certainly within the last- Wild rice, wild rice. Yeah, yeah, wild rice, right? So how long have they been eating wild rice? Is it, is this, was this part of a move? I mean, they're not necessarily uh, growing it, right? Um, but was this part of a move consistent with the Neolithic revolution? Was there a decrease, a decline in, you know, megafauna? Like how long have they been eating wild rice? Is it just a 10,000 year thing? Because one of the biggest puzzles I think we have in the history of Homo sapiens over the last 50,000 years is the disappearance of megafauna throughout the world and what caused it and then how we adapted to it, right? And so that's- Pleistocene, what's that? it's a cool, the Pleistocene yes. 
It's a very interesting story. Yes, yes. And, you know, the younger dry ass period and this, you know, this 12,000 year ago period, like what the heck happened? So it's, it's interesting to me because um, I think that there's, there's a lot of questions there. Um, about so if I hear you, like, you're, you're almost contending like that these were poverty foods from a disrupted life way. That's, that's the hypothesis. I'd like to corroborate yeah. that and do more research and like suspect, like if you, I'm just thinking like, if you could hunt bison or eat wild rice, like why would you eat wild rice? You know, like, why would you do something oh, like yeah, that? Dude, I would love to serve you wild rice. I intend to serve you wild rice. I, I will eat it. I've eaten rice in the past. Um, oh, my concerns, rice. yeah, rice. yeah, my wild rice. My concerns about rice are generally the metals and the soil and how much accumulates in it and stuff. And so I'd be curious. Oh, wild rice, wild, wild, an aquatic grain. You go out by canoe. This is a <laughs> wild born grain. You uh -huh. go out by canoe, two people, and, and you knock this rice into the boat and you process that into the most incredible, fully wild, non-agricultural food. So anyway, I just want to clarify, this is not like patty grown stuff I'm talking about. I'm talking about a foraged wild food. But Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested in it. I, I want, it'd just be so interesting to get a time machine. We're going to build one. Yeah, be like, know. you know, at what point did they start doing this, you know, yeah. um, and, and what were the other pressures around? Um, okay. I think, I, I agree with you. I think sucrose has been a part of the human diet forever. Uh, certainly honey is eaten everywhere in the world where it's found. And I, I'm sure that people ate maple syrup where you are evolutionarily. And then in, in terms of the drugs, quote unquote, I think that it, it kind of goes back to the plants as medicine versus plants as food. Yep. And yes, I think that um, psilocybin, super valuable compound. I've used psilocybin twice. I've talked openly about this in, on multiple you know, occasions and it's been very valuable for me. It's been very insightful. I've never used DMT or done ayahuasca though. It's something that I intend to do in the future. Um, but you know, even, even within mainstream medicine now, um, MDMA, though that's not necessarily from a plant, but psilocybin certainly is becoming more mainstream and is used in a lot of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And I think it will gain acceptance and uh, FDA approval in the future for things like PTSD. So that's a very valuable molecule. Two now, publicly traded companies now who are in that game, which is interesting to see. Yeah, yeah, stuff. yeah. And we don't, we probably shouldn't use psilocybin every day. Like it's not a food, right? This is not- I got some friends I should tell that to. I know, well, <laughs> and, that, I would, and that would be an interesting conversation that I could have with them because there is certainly tachyphylaxis with these compounds. And by that, that's a technical term that I- uh, will clarify means like the body does adjust. You know, if you give the body metoprolol or a beta blocker, if you give the body a pharmaceutical molecule from a plant, uh, generally uh, one of these compounds, the body will adjust. We see this with caffeine, right? It's an adenosine receptor antagonist and the body certainly changes the way it does things with cyclic AMP. And that's why people get withdrawal when they stop it. So there is a tachyphylaxis effect. And with some of these compounds, I worry about overuse. And I worry about long-term overuse of psilocybin. I certainly think we wouldn't want a long-term overuse DMT. But ritualistically, yeah, these things I believe have value. Even nicotine is used by people, uh, you know, whether they're, uh, you know, smoking tobacco or chewing tobacco or something uh, evolutionarily. I mean, people do all kinds of snuffing it. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, epena, uh, you know, all these things like they're uh, they're used and. I, but I think, you know, long-term they're going to change our physiology. So I think that it's my sense, not living in indigenous tribe is that they're regarded more as sacramental things rather than consistent all the time. Um, or maybe that's the, maybe that's yeah, not the way. That, that, that hasn't been what I've seen. Yeah, but yeah. again, I mean, I'm no anthropologist, but boy, it seems like wherever these things are found, like you brought up caffeine. So that whole group of xanthine. So, you know, theobromine, theophylline, caffeine, wherever they are found, they are like, or, you know, there's that thing people will say that trope, like, well, the Native Americans, I mean, whenever you hear that, you know, like we're in for some bullshit, you know, like, well, the Native Americans, like it's 500 nations, dude, like they're not all doing the same thing, but people will say the Native Americans use tobacco ritualistically. It's like, yeah, how many times a day do they have a ritual? Cause they're, you know, it's a highly addictive thing. So, you know, coca, it's like, they're chewing it every night in the jungle, you know, hape, they're, all the time up the nose, you know, you see this use that you're like, wow, that's, I mean, I wouldn't, you know what I mean? So it does seem like 
you know, is that just the nature of human addiction or is there value there? Do I, am I putting hunter gatherer groups on too much of a pedestal and thinking their lifestyle is too ideal and optimal, uh, you know? But um, I also, uh, what I wanted to say to you that if you decide to experiment with uh, DMT, I think you should do it from the toad, man. Go animal source. 5-MEO? That I, I mean, 5-MEO is awesome. Catching those toads is really cool. And the uh, experience is really neat to watch how the toad almost treats you like it's relieved that you've taken this burden off of its back. Really? It's, oh yeah, it's fascinating. It's unbelievable. You lift this guy up and you squeeze his glands onto a plate and then you set him down and he just hangs around by your feet like as if he's glad you did it. It's so weird. Um, but anyway, I, I like that idea for you, you know, with what you do and, and how you, you look at the world. I think that animal source makes much more sense than mimosa or something like that. I mean, I would, I'm interested in all of it. I think that for me personally, I don't feel called to, um, to much of it right now. I mean, my life is so good in Costa Rica, but I think that if I did feel called to it, I, I think it's valuable. And I think that there's so much value to these, you know, marijuana and cannabinoids are another class. People always ask me, what do you think about marijuana? And I think, well, it's a, it's a psychoactive compound that mimics endogenous cannabinoids like an andamide. And I think it can be overused and it does seem to affect the body in certain ways, lowering testosterone, et cetera. And don't use marijuana to treat your anxiety if there's another cause for your anxiety. Now, what's so interesting for me about psychedelics or we could call them entheogens or whatever, is that, that so many of us grow up with these schema in our brains and these, we're just, we just grow up with these stories. Perhaps this is part of growing up in the West you know, and we grow up with these inferiority stories or these strange stories from our parents and unwinding a lot of that and really turning off the default mode network in our brain, I think is such a valuable thing. So I think a big antidote to growing up in Western world is, are these psychedelic compounds. But I, I certainly have felt that I was like, okay, cool. That was valuable. I'm not called to do it all the time. But to your point, I do think that there is this question about these things. Like, does it speak to the addictiveness of the human nature you know, the fact that they're, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're not using it sacramentally at all. Maybe that's just a complete. Uh, well, I think they are, but I, I don't think they're separating them the way we do. Like this is sacred. This is profane. Like we live in this weird dichotomy yeah. where it's like church on Sunday is sacred. The rest of the week is profane. You know, like, I think it's like, Hey, you want to sit and pray? Right. Seven, eight hours later. Hey, you want to sit and pray? You know, like I, you know, there's a more constant communion going on. And I think that we, I, I recently interviewed uh, Sam Fair. He's sort of like the most prominent forager in the United States. And he, the whole interview, which will be coming out soon, a, a big piece of it is about the inherent, um, how do you say it, biases in anthropology. Mm. And that he's like, if you pick it apart the way I do, he's saying like, you could almost look at anthropology as a, like an apologist thing for trying to dehumanize the uncivilized peoples of the world, you know? And he laid out some of those biases. So I think we put these overlays on them sometimes, like this is, they do this for sacrament. It's like, that's how European missionaries going there in the 1500s interpreted what they were seeing without being able to speak their language sometimes. And now these tropes have followed all you know all the way up till today and, and maybe it's not always fair what we say about them too you know yeah and i will say that when i went to visit the hadza i think that tobacco doesn't grow there as far as i know but they smoke a lot of tobacco and they, sm <laughs> and they smoke a lot of ganja a lot of marijuana oh, and, yeah they and i think that it's given to them by all sorts of people now I, I, maybe it's grown yeah so there i think that you, you bring up a good point, which is that as humans, we are prone to addictions and when given, and I think it's actually a, quite an interesting model for a Pandora's box type of thing, um, if this is accurate. And, and the same thing happens with Pop-Tarts and Skittles, right? The first time yeah. humans tasted Pop-Tarts and Skittles, we were really doomed uh, until we really figured out like, oh wait, this is evolutionary programming saying that sugar is good, except this is sugar in an industrialized food product. So you're you have to really kind of like realize that, that your evolution is working against you here. And for whatever reason, humans appear to really like addictive things. I guess it makes sense. It's like, it's, that's kind of a circular statement, but we, we like these all, we like these mind altering substances for whatever reason. And animals do too, you know? 
Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. I've seen that, um, I've seen that video on the web of the Jaguar on DMT, but I wonder, like, because caffeine is actually a, you know, a phytoalexin, caffeine is a defense chemical. Um, and, uh, you know, many of these things are defense chemicals. I wonder if there are animal species that eat, you know, psilocybin, cubenzies, or, you know, the psychedelic mushrooms. Or oh, There's definitely a lot of reports on this. You know, you, are you familiar with the whole thing with caribou and the caribou urine and the Christmas mythology and all of that? A little bit, a little bit. Tell me about the, it. the caribou eat Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Right, right. And you can, you know, that that does contain a strong toxin that you can process, but it's hard on your body. But the reindeer herders figured out that they could collect the urine and get, you know, the, where that's been denatured, and then they can drink the urine and get the high without the hardness on their body, on their liver, or whatever. So, uh, you know, that becomes the flying reindeer. Those are the caribou, so the caribou herders in Siberia, you know, where this mushroom grows. It's all tied into this ancient kind of psychedelic shamanic lore. But there are a lot of reports of animals, even um, elephants and uh, primates that eat fermented fruits and get and drunk get on it, you know, and we'll look for that preferentially and those kind of things. So. Uh, that part of it's pretty interesting to me, like that it's not, maybe it's not just people. We're just, because I want to go back to what you said, which is again, really insightful. The problem to me is like, for instance, we, you, you put a bit of sugar on anybody. You put sugar on the, a child's tongue, a baby's tongue. They light up because sugar's hard to get in the wild. The costs are high. You're going to go after bees, dig out a honeybees, I mean, you're getting stung, you're climbing high, maybe you fall and die. These are hard to attain foods. Fat, I always try to tell people, I, I get my wild fats largely from bear. It's mm. not easy to get a bear and then to process that fat. Fat is hard to get on the landscape. Protein, it's hard to get this stuff, right? So now we're in this environment where there's, it is too easy to get sugar, too easy to get fat, too easy. And we often leave out that alcohol is a macronutrient, seven calories per gram, right? I mean, in, in if you were looking at it from an energy kilocalorie perspective, you could say it's more nutritious than protein and more nutritious than carbohydrate from a, you know, it's toxic, you know, and the metabolism is hard on your body, but it's a macronutrient. So these are all hard to acquire in the natural environment. The thing that's probably the easiest to get in the environment is like maybe fiber. Everything else is like really hard to get. So, so it makes sense you're programmed that when you get it to gorge on it. And so the problem I think we have is access. Not, it's not the addiction. It's that the agriculture and industrialization has given us too much access and we don't know how to control this inborn desire for these things that was there to keep us alive and now is killing us. I wonder why species seek out alcohol and fermentation because man, the Hadza love it. It was, there were some things that were brilliant about being there and some things that within my paradigm, and maybe this is again, just my, my bias that we're sad to see, you know, when they had the access, they would go buy alcohol and, and they would drink it and they would immediately be drunk. And you were just like, humans, this is who we are. We're trying to yeah. figure it out. Yeah. But but I do think, you know, to, to bring it full circle, I do think the, there are super important questions about what is a species appropriate diet for humans. And I think that it's very clear that that species appropriate diet is, is something that we obtain through, through hunting and gathering. Yeah. And, um, you know, my perspective would be that that was mostly hunting and that that, that was the preferred food. But I suppose yeah. depending on the latitude and the time of year, there certainly were times when there were the hunts were not as successful, but yeah, yeah, it's a it's a yeah, fascinating you know, that, I think to that point too. Like another thing that I think is important for modern people to remember is that almost anywhere you look in the world, the number of species consumed is just vastly greater amongst hunter gatherers than modern people. I mean, something like the average American eats like around thirty foods, a, thirty species a year. But you know, a hunter gatherer in this same area where I live might eat two hundred species a year and might know how to eat three or four hundred if they needed to. And I think that's one of the biggest things is that we've just gotten hyper-focused on a handful of things and it's almost incestuous how we do it. And uh, I think more variety would be really, really good for people. And it's the same with animals. Like um, I can go down to my freezer right now. Like, so this is the typical conversation with my wife before we have dinner. It's like, hey, what animal we wanna eat tonight? 
because I don't want to eat deer every single night. I'll get sick of it. I want to rotate it with different fish and different small game and different birds so that we're eating a variety. So I need to eat, I need to hunt a dozen species a year just to have, and, and how many species do people eat in a year? They eat cow, they eat pig, they eat chicken, maybe one type of fish and that's it. And it's like, man, there's so much out there. Cicadas might be too far for somebody, but wow, it's like, there's so much out there to explore and enjoy. And each of those animals becomes totemic to you and they teach you things. You learn about the environment by chasing after these animals. And I just can't emphasize enough how enriching that can be to your life. Now, do you eat the organs? Tell me about the organs. Here's an interesting thing with hunting. Um, if you're going to, when you're talking about like getting a grass fed liver, you're talking about an animal that's like one year old, right? Uh -huh. And it's, that animal has been usually like, let's say that it's on being raised on grass. It's in a very controlled setting. Now let's say I'm hunting a deer in Wisconsin where there is ag fields. Now that deer is not going to live just on ag food. It's not going to just eat corn. It's going to eat, it's an herbivore who's going to browse, but it's going to be getting into some Monsanto Roundup ready. Mm. Now look at modern hunting and how opposite it is to how hunter gatherers work. In modern hunting, there's this whole trophy aspect to it. So people want to go get the opposite of what a predator takes. The predator takes, as we talked about before, they're looking for that tinder, right? So they're looking for the young or the old, but not like the buck who's like at his prime. That's the hardest thing to do. So you go get that animal. Let's say he's six years old and he's been running around in some mix of forest and agricultural fields that have been sprayed. Do I want to eat a six-year-old liver exposed to Roundup ready? No. But if I shoot a, you know, a spike or a button buck who's, he's young and I've got him in the forests of New England, yeah, I'm eating that liver, right? So those are actually things to think about because nobody goes to the farm and goes like, hey, give me the 10-year-old cow with the oldest, gnarliest sclerotic liver. Right. It doesn't happen. So I think that with hunting, you have to be pretty uh, selective about what you want to eat. Like I always feel really lucky as the ducks come down, the waterfowl comes down from the Arctic and comes down to us as they head south. I know they've had a lot less exposure, but in some places, like if you're hunting ducks in the south, well, they're hitting the ag fields the whole way there. What's, where's all that stuff ending up in their fat and their bones and their liver? Do I want to make a bone stock out of a duck that's been in all these industrial ag fields? Probably not. Where's that, those metals end up in their bones. So, so actually I think hunting is um, not the same as buying organic produce or, you know, you have to be thoughtful about how you pick these animals apart. So um, like to me, fishing in the ocean's a lot. I mean, I know people have a lot to say about the toxicity of the ocean. It's like, dude, yeah, but the ocean's big. You want to fish in a little pond and eat the bass. Like that could be kind of gnarly depending on what's in that area. Right. So I'm always thinking about what's clean and can I get younger, smaller animals? Yeah. So I that I, things like eat the organs. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the cleanliness of the organs is, is paramount. It's, it's interesting. The sourcing is so important with these things. And that's yeah. so interesting to think about. All right, man, as we wrap up, tell me about your tattoos. I've seen these on you for years. This is like intense, like these arms, like full sleeves. Is there yeah. a story here? There's so much story and many stories and many years of it. Um, <laughs> I'll just tell one story. And I'll say I was very influenced by a Maori guy that I had met who had, you know, full face tattoos and full sleeves. But uh, the piece I'll leave you with is on my hands, I have these two eyes. I love doing this to kids in public. <laughs> um, and I have this um, philosophy about um, binocular vision. And that's that. And it really relates to this thing. Like, like, I like to look at the world as I'm half vegan, half carnivore, for instance. That gives me two points of perspective. So it's like, you know, if you hold your finger out and you close one eye and then you open and close each eye, it's like your finger seems to be moving, but it's really that you're seeing from two slightly different, you got like an inch and a half between your eyes or whatever, two inches between your pupils, let's say. So you're seeing from two perspectives and that gives you depth. And so to me, I think we have these two brain hemispheres that kind of have opposite ways of viewing the world so that we get a really well-rounded view of the world. So for me, these eyes represent and are a reminder to try to see things from two perspectives so that I have depth to what I'm talking about. Because if we get too one-sided and I'm only a left brain person or I'm only a right brain person, 
man, you end up with um, no depth perception. And so you end up in these conversations that become arguments with people who are like, man, they have no depth perception. You got to see the world through two perspectives. And so, you know, I always go like there's a right wing and a left wing on every plane that I want to fly in. I do not want to be in an only left wing plane or an only right wing plane. You know, I want to have two perspectives and you don't need, they don't need to be that far apart to get depth. And so um, those tattoos are a reminder for me about that. But ultimately all the tattoos together are, um, I grew up looking at National Geographic magazines and seeing these hunter gatherers and being like, man, piercings and tattoos. And I was always really drawn to wanting to express that um, part of me that's indigenous to the earth, you know? I love it. And I like that part about two perspectives. You know, I was at a, at a dinner last night with some folks here who are working on cryptocurrency and you know, there were varying opinions about different cryptocurrencies and varying opinions about climate change and varying apparent opinions about energy use for Bitcoin. And I think that a bunch of us at the dinner agreed, and I'd heard this, and I think it's so, so important. Like the, the, the further I go in life, the more important I believe it is to, to be a person and to be around people who are able to hold two opposing opinions in their mind at the same time and kind of entertain both. Um, and, and I'm trying to do more of that as a human. I think that's super important. Like, and you know this, and you've met people like this, probably everyone listening to this podcast has met people like this. Certainly with what I do, when I tell people what I do, there are some people who just completely shut off. They cannot hold another opinion in their mind. And this is just, that to me is such a bummer because I think like, wow, we could have such a good conversation um, if you could hold two opinions. And, and that really reminds me, like I should work on doing that myself too. Like I want to be able to hold two opinions, even though I believe that an animal-based diet composed of, you know, animal foods and organs and the least toxic plant foods is ideal for humans. I want to at least be able to entertain ideas that are contrary to that and think like, well, maybe this, maybe I'm wrong because that's how we learn, right? Unless we can entertain something outside of what we believe, we're really not going to grow much. So having that alternative perspective is super important. And I think well, it's those something- two, you get those two spheres and they overlap. That's called that vesica Pisces, right? And yeah. that, that space where it's like, you transcend both ideas and it's like, oh man, if I'm a vegan and you're a carnivore, what matters more is that we can give each other a hug and recognize each other's humanity. That is way more powerful than what we both don't eat. That's so much, much more important. Uh, and if you can hold both, if that's the third eye is the whole idea. It's the pineal gland between the two hemispheres. So you have this eye, this eye, and then there's something in the middle. And that middle space is way more interesting to me at this stage of my life than the one side or the other. Yeah, totally. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Where can people find more of your stuff if they want to see you eat cicadas? Yeah, I'm at Daniel Vitalis on Instagram, uh, wild-fed.com. And you can find me on Outdoor Channel uh, 7 p.m. East um, on cable. Awesome. Thanks, man. I can't wait to eat cicadas with you. I will come do it. And Serving them on wild rice. <laughs> awesome. We're going to eat cicadas on wild rice. and But only if we drink reindeer pee <laughs> and toad and, DM. Yes, yes. This is we're gonna record it. It's gonna be on it's gonna be on YouTube. Wait for this guys. It'll it'll be amazing.